when we talk about um, enlargement of the prostate, what does it mean? Well, first of all, the prostate is a gland that's used to make seminal fluid, and that's used for fertility. And that's the only purpose of it, is for fertility. It's not necessarily for uh, erect erections. Everybody worries about erectile dysfunction in the prostate. Um, pro the only purpose of the prostate is to make that seminal fluid. And so, why is, does it increase over time? And as you age, why does it get bigger? The reason for that is because Throughout your life, you have testosterone. Testosterone drives the growth of the prostate, and with that, it enlarges. So what has, happens when it enlarges? It starts to block the urethra. I'll show you a diagram in just a, sh a second, going over why that becomes a problem for urination. It does affect a lot of people. A lot of men have an enlarged prostate and symptoms because of that. When we look at the anatomy, where is the prostate? And, you know, where is it is in relation to the urination? We look here. This is the bladder. Um, right through the middle here is called the urethra. That's the urinary tube where the urine flows through. The prostate is right here, and it's a donut going all the way around. This is a side view. This is a straight-on view looking at it. And what we see here is the bladder, the urethra, and again the prostate right here, kind of being a donut going all the way around. As men age, their prostates start to enlarge. It happens to everyone, but it's a matter of how much it blocks the flow of the urine, which determines whether you have symptoms or not. What we see here is as it enlarges, it starts blocking that flow. Urine has a tougher time going through there. With that tougher time going through there, patients start having slower urination. They feel like they're not emptying completely. The sense of urgency, a sense of frequency, have to get up in the middle of the night. Those are common symptoms that we see associated with an enlarged prostate. This kind of goes over the things I just described. Um, weak, weak stream, uh, feeling of incomplete emptying. Occasionally it can, it can even be urinary incontinence leaking a little bit. How is a prostate evaluated? Well, first of all, it needs to be evaluated by a physician. There's a few different things that we need to do. First of all, we need to feel the prostate. Obviously, we, you always hear about the, you know, the, the entity of prostate cancer. Well, that's something that needs to be ruled out. We need to make sure there's not prostate cancer before we embark on treating you for enlargement of the prostate. How is that checked? There's two things that we do. One is we feel the prostate, and number two, it's a blood test. So that's that PSA test. So what you see here is a digital rectal exam and a PSA test. Those are the two things we do to ensure you don't have cancer. It's a screening test. Once that's done, we further evaluate you, asking your symptoms. Much of the things, the symptoms are those things on the previous slide. How often are you going in the middle of the night? How's your stream? Is it slower? Uh, you know, do you have to go back to the bathroom after, you've, after you feel like you've emptied? And then finally, um, what you see here is a urine flow rate. This is something that I do. Um, some of the other doctors do it as well in our, in our practice. Um, and basically, we have you urinate into a container, and we will measure how fast is the urine coming out. And I can tell you, so many cc's per second, and there's an average that we look at for men in certain age groups. And you should have a certain value that we're looking for. Um, you know, if it's a little low, usually we start you on some medications, or we're going to get into some other options. When we talk about the treatment, there are different treatments associated with it, and it can be. Medications, most commonly you've heard of medications, Flomax, Avidart, those are the ones that everybody most commonly hears of. Those are the medications, they work well, however, a lot of patients can't tolerate them, or they don't like the side effects. Uh, or thirdly, the cost. Um, you're going to be on medications for an extended period of time. Some patients don't want to be putting forth that cost, and so is there something else that we can do uh, that can still treat the enlargement of the prostate without... Uh, without the need for a medication for the rest of their lives. There is. Uh, there's this microwave therapy. It's called cool thermotherapy, and I'll go over the reasons why that is in just a second. But I also want to show in this continuum of treatment of the prostate that there can be surgery as well. And so that's something you may have heard of, for lack of a better term. We call it a roto-rooter. Uh, you kind of go in there and clean out the prostate from the inside. That's a surgery. It does require hospitalization most commonly catheter as well. Um, I think the next slide actually will show uh, a slide after that. But let me just go over this. This is, I mentioned the fact that there's drug therapy. You need to take it every day. It can be costly. If you look at the price you know, on a monthly basis and look at it over the long term, it can be quite costly. But 
it is sometimes effective in patients. Um, oftentimes it's not. And if it's not effective, let's move on to the next step. Some patients don't want to move necessarily to surgery. So the option is what, what I was proposing today is potentially this microwave therapy. And I'm going to go over the reasons why I think that it might be a good therapy. Talking a little bit more about that surgery, um, that's the TERP, also called the rotor rooter um, Going through, basically, uh, it is effective, but it does require general anesthesia or a spinal anesthetic. That makes it difficult for a lot of patients who can't tolerate anesthesia or don't want anesthesia. Um, also, we also have, um, we don't have less of a need for uh, stopping medications with other procedures as opposed to surgery. With surgery, we worry about the need to stop some of the medications, and some people can't get off of their medications, and that becomes problematic. Kind of the in-between, uh, again, showing the continuum of the therapy, going from doing nothing, actually, to all the way to surgery. In the middle, there's a microwave therapy. It's a single uh, in-office procedure, and so, again, we're not going to the operating room for this. There's no need for general anesthesia. Most commonly, I use local anesthesia, meaning a little bit of lidocaine jelly. And that helps numb up the urethra a little bit, that urinary tube that I was describing. Um, it is something that has been around for a while. Why am I proposing it today if we've had it for a while? Well, the company has really done a good job with changing um, the catheters, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. The catheters have actually gotten better so that there is less irritation afterwards and the efficacy is actually better. That kind of got me back into wanting to try it, and I tried it in patients and realized that this is something that is worthwhile, and I've gotten patients off of medication. It's not for everyone, but a lot of people are starting to show some interest in it, and I looked into it a little lot more, and I feel that it's a good way to treat enlargement of the prostate that's non-surgical and without use of medications. Can last a long time. We'll go over a little bit about the efficacy a little bit later. So this is the catheter. When I was describing uh, the catheter, this is what it looks like. There's a tip inside the bladder. This is the bladder. Um, this is the urethra, the urinary tube. This is the prostate going around, uh, like, kind of like a donut. The catheter is this blue structure that goes into the bladder. There's a balloon right here. Essentially what it's doing is delivering microwave therapy to the prostate. So through this uh, catheter, it is delivering that microwave therapy. Um, what is different about the catheters now? They are more precise in the, in the delivery of the microwave therapy. It's delivering it more to the area that needs to be treated as opposed to adjacent structures. Also, there's decreased irritation on the inside of this urinary tube called the urethra. That commonly was causing burning after the procedure for extended periods of time or even during the procedure. The newer catheters have a lot less of that. There will still be a slight burning associated with it, but not nearly as bad as it used to be. I, there's patients who you'd have to stop the procedure. Now patients tolerate it very well. The procedure um, takes about half hour. I think there's a slide in just a minute that will show that. Um, what needs to be done beforehand? Well, obviously I described you need to be evaluated by your physician, whoever that might be. Uh, before the procedure, we're not having you drink a lot of fluids. We want to keep that bladder empty because that catheter is going to be in there for about a half hour. Um, eat a light meal. We don't want you to have, you know, be too full during the procedure. We will have you do an enema, cleaning out the rectum. Why, why do we need to do that? Part of the measurement of the temperature, which is a big component of the uh, treatment, uh, is that we need to make sure that it doesn't, that temperature doesn't get too hot behind the prostate. So we do put a probe inside the rectum. And that one will actually, uh, it's a temperature probe, which is measuring how much heat is being delivered to the rectum. And that will help determine how much uh, therapy will be uh, given to the prostate itself. So this is all calculated. You can continue your normal medications, which is a nice thing. Don't have to get you off of a lot of, a lot of patients are on aspirin and Coumadin and these kinds of things. Don't necessarily have to have you off of those, which is a nice thing. This is what the catheter actually looks like. It's kind of this kind of deal. The only part that's going in the, in the, in the patient is this white part. The rest of this is all outside. Um, that balloon would be right here, and this is the actual portion that's going to be delivering the microwave therapy. It takes about a half hour for the procedure itself. Obviously, we have you come in, get you, prepper, uh, get you uh, prepared, and then 
get everything set up. Once we're set up, it takes about a half hour. Um, what is different? Why is it this, this therapy I feel more comfortable with giving now? It's because this catheter has integrated a cooling mechanism in it so that it keeps the urethra, that urinary tube, which I was describing as a potential point where there could be some burning with urination, it keeps that a lot cooler. And then at the same time, it's still delivering the microwave therapy to the prostate. This is kind of showing again what I was describing earlier. This area is where the microwave therapy is being delivered from into the prostate. There is a cooling mechanism inside this tube that kind of goes alongside the urethra to keep that area cool. After the procedure, most patients go back to their regular activity. The big question is, do I need a catheter? Most commonly, I do put a catheter in for, I do it for two days, you know, some people do it three to five days, it's variable. Catheter, the reason for that is because there's going to be a little bit of swelling. In de delivering that energy, it will cause a little bit of swelling direct, immediately after the procedure. And so we want that swelling to come down before we take out that catheter so that you can urinate normally. Symptoms will take a little bit of time to improve after the procedure. Why is that? Well, twofold. One, I just described that swelling. That swelling will need to come down somewhat. Also, that the, pr the prostate itself starts to shrink. What do I mean by shrink? Well, this diagram, the, the pictures actually show it very well. This is what I'm looking at when I actually look inside the prostate. I, I don't know if any of the patients here have had it, a little scope look in, to look inside, but this is what we look at. We actually can see that this is prostate tissue. Through there would be the bladder. So the expectation is you should be able to see through there. Well, this one, there's an enlarged prostate you can't see through there. After the procedure, as the tissue starts to shrink, the swelling goes down and it starts to shrink, we start seeing that this aperture starts to enlarge. With that enlargement, you see a nice wide open channel. That wide open channel is what we're trying to achieve to get that urine to flow better. So this is BPH. When we talk about it, BPH, this is it right here. This is the blockage, blockage of the urethra. So this is what we're trying to achieve. So what is the advantage of it? Again, I'd like to reiterate that it is an in-office procedure. It's not something that you have to go under general anesthesia for. It's efficacious. It does work very well. Um, but when we talk about how long does it work for, that's a question that always comes up. Currently, there's five-year data that supports it. However, there's patients who are going to do better for a longer period of time. It's, every patient is an individual. Some patients will be a shorter amount of time. We always quote about five years. At five years, 85 to 90 percent of patients don't need another procedure done. And so that's something to keep in mind. Why would there be a need for a procedure in the future? And that's a big question that I, uh, that's often asked. Even with surgery, there's a potential for a need for a procedure in the future. The reason for that is the reason why the prostate grows is because of the testosterone. I started out by saying that. Well, the testosterone is still around even after the procedure. So the prostate will continue to grow. As it regrows, it will start to cause blockage again. So you may need a procedure again in the future with any procedure that we do, even surgery. Um, this is covered by the majority of insurance. So that's another good thing. Um, Anesthesia free, other than the fact that I'm putting a little bit of lidocaine jelly. So this is something that you don't need to have general anesthesia for or spinal anesthetic. And please don't be doing this and figuring you can do your own microwave therapy. <laughs> but that is the same idea, just a little bit more uh, technical. If there's no other questions, I want to thank you for coming. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be me. It can be any of the physicians. If they don't want to do it, you're welcome to come see me and then go back and see them afterwards. There's no problem with that. We offer it at, at Urology Associates, so it's something that if you'd like to do, we can do it. But again, it's in, in the continuum of being treated for, pro, for enlarged prostate. It's not necessarily this is what you have to do, but there's medications, there's, there's this, there's surgery. So there's different options available. So don't think that you know, you've tried medications for 10 years and it's still not better. Well, there are other options that you maybe don't have require surgery. So just keep that in mind.